Okay, we're going to start. Make up time. Near was bad, so I have to be good and kind of move it along. Okay. So we're going to do it Bob Barker style. I'm going to call people to come on down as I introduce them, right? So we're going to start off today's panel. I'm Glenn Cohen. I should introduce myself. I've already come on down, right? Uh, today's panel is going to be about examining what, uh, dent, what a carefully designed, implemented labeling program could do for the global burden of disease. Uh, and first, we're going to hear from Nicole Hassoun, who's a philosopher who runs the Global Health Impact Project, which is a proposal for rating pharmaceutical companies on the basis of their uh, global health impact. Then we're going to hear from Josh Salomon from HSPH, who is at the center of work at the Pivotal Gates-funded Global Burden of Disease Project, who's briefly going to talk about the project and present uh, its wonderful website, among other things. We're then going to hear from Aidan Hollis. Aidan, you're supposed to sit up here. Come on down, right? Aiden is an economist who seeks to use the Global Burden of Disease findings to inform the work of the Health Impact Fund, an idea which I'll briefly explain. Then we're going to hear about some student activism from John Stroom from FAS and Eric Ast, friend from HBS, who will describe student activism around Harvard, including the notion of effective uh, altruism. Uh, and I apparently don't have a seat, so I'm going to sit right over there. But I'm told to remind people to push the red button when they want to speak because it's being recorded. And if you don't push the red button, we will lose your brilliance for posterity, which would be a huge shame. So with that said, let's move right along. Nicole, you have the floor. All right. So I want to start just by thanking Nir and Jennifer for putting together such an exciting conference. I've published several papers, and, and my book talks a bit about the policy um, potential of global health impact labels. But I want to talk today about a, a, an index that I've been designing. And if I can figure out how to use the Prezi, I can do that. All right. This is the Global Health Impact Index, a rating system that evaluates pharmaceutical companies' attempts to extend access on essential medicines around the world. Companies' scores are based on their malaria, TB, HIV, and AIDS medicines, global health impact. The index opens the door to many ways of promoting global health. It provides essential information for companies, researchers, policymakers, socially conscious investors, consumers, and the general public. Sorry. <laughs> Consider just one way of using the information the labeling system, our rating system provides. Using the rating system, it's possible to give the best companies in a given year a label that they can use on all of their products, everything from pet vitamins to mouthwash that they make. If only 1% of consumers prefer global health impact products uh, over the counter and generic products, that would be $360 million worth of incentive for companies to extend access on essential medicines every year. That's about uh, the price of a new drug per year on a reasonable estimate. I want to tell you today how we construct the index. So there's basically three steps here. The first step is to do an effectiveness analysis to determine promising drugs uh, impacts, okay? And that's the hardest part, so I'll talk about that. We can then rank, rate the companies based on aggregating their drugs impacts, and that will allow us then to rank, rate the companies um, get either by their relative or absolute standing. Again, the hardest part is to determine the drug's impacts. And to do this, we look at three things. Uh, the need for the drugs, the percentage of people who can access them, and their efficacy. So consider a simple example, toy example. Suppose 100 million people die from a disease in a given year. If 50% of people have access to the medicine for that disease, and there's one medicine, <laughs> then we would assume that that medicine could save um, 50 million lives at best. Uh, and then if the medicine's only 80% effective, we'd estimate it that it would save about 40 million lives. In reality, we look at the disability-adjusted life years lost to the diseases, which is a measure of both the death and disability due to the disease. Uh, we look at global treatment percentages, and we look at efficacy data from clinical trials. Things are a bit more complicated than that because you need disease models and you have to look at different patient groups and so forth, but that's the general idea. So once we have these drug scores, then what we do is we aggregate by company. And you can take a simple example again. Suppose one company makes two drugs, let's say 40 and, and 60 million life years each. Then you can aggregate those and you might get a score of 100 million for that company. Another company might make three drugs and make, save 10, 20, and 30 million life years million life years each, and that company then would have a score of 60. 
And so the first, co uh, the, the first company would be ranked higher than the second company. Here's a, a map of some of our data for the disability adjusted life years lost around the world. Red indicates a low number of dailies lost and green indicates a higher number. This comes from the Global Burden of Disease Study. Here's a sample of treatment coverage information for the main drugs for PFALC malaria, which we're looking at. Uh, this is probably the weakest version of the data in our model. It comes from the WHO, however, so we're using that for now. And then we also use WHO information on efficacy for these drugs. This is for erythromelumifantrine. Actually, this is collected data. We've done a systematic review of, of data to get this efficacy information. The result, again, is a ranking of companies. Here you see um, the percentage of the disease burden that's alleviated by the companies together that's alleviated by each company. So I'd like to thank all the people and organizations supporting the index, uh, my team at Binghamton, Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh, and John Hopkins for their help in constructing it. And we're currently seeking to expand our network and engage in new collaborations. We hope that one day everyone can support this global health impact rating system and create incentives for companies to extend access on essential medicines globally by purchasing products with a global health impact label, investing in global health impact certified companies, and so forth. Together, we can make a difference for global health. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so you've already heard uh, Nicole mention the Global Burden of Disease Study. What I wanted to do uh, in my five to seven minutes was, uh, was to give you a brief introduction to that study uh, for uh, some of you who may be uh, less familiar or not at all familiar with it. Uh, so what is the Global Burden of Disease Study? Uh, well, this is an effort uh, that was initiated back uh, about 20 years ago now uh, originally with support from the World Bank, uh, much of the work uh, was done here at Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, but the goal of the effort is to try to quantify the comparative magnitude of health losses. So this is not a measure of uh, economic well-being or any sort of broader notion of welfare, but health losses. Uh, and to attribute those to diseases, injuries, and risk factors in such a way that we can also look in, uh, to disaggregate these impacts by age, sex, country, uh, and at different moments in time. Uh, so the study uh, was originally launched back around 1991, uh, and results have been published in various iterations uh, since then, uh, including efforts to expand from a global or regional focus to um, national burden of disease studies. Uh, so this is all uh, what was done sort of until recent years. The most recent round of the study, the Global Burden of Disease 2010, uh, was a vast expansion of the scope and ambition of the study. Uh, so for the Global Burden of Disease 2010, for the first time, the unit of analysis was 187 countries. Uh, for the first time, there was estimation at two points in time to allow uh, comparison. Uh, and there was also an expansion of the list of uh, diseases, injuries, and risk factors that were examined. So a list of about 300 diseases and injuries as causes of lost health about 1,160 disabling consequences of these that go under the rubric of sequelae, uh, and also attribution of uh, lost health, not just to disease and injury causes, but to some 70 different risk factors. This was a vast collaborative undertaking uh, th that was led from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, uh, steered by a, a group of uh, five core academic institutions, including Harvard, uh, but involving about 500 collaborators and in 300 institutions around the world. 
Uh, the results from the GBD 2010 were published about a year ago now in a series of papers in The Lancet. Uh, and that was publication of the global and regional results. Since that time, uh, there have been a handful of national burden of disease studies that have been published in the US, the UK, China, and elsewhere. And the study has moved into the next phase, which will include uh, more regular updating of the study uh, on an annual basis. Uh, we'll add components such as projections, uh, longer list of causes, uh, and in some places, uh, an effort to disaggregate to a sub-national level. Uh, so in, in a very brief amount of time, I want to give you the sort of 50 cent tour of the results. Uh, overall, given the scope of this with countries, uh, multiple causes, two points in time, disaggregation by age and sex, there's about 650 million different results. Uh, so one of the important pieces of the GBD 2010 uh, has been to try to develop uh, some data visualization tools that are made publicly available and hosted on the uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation website uh, to try to really make this information accessible to policymakers uh, or virtually anybody uh, who has access to a computer and uh, internet. So these are live data visualization tools that you can find on the web. And let me use these to give you a very quick spin through some of the results. There are several of these different uh, tools available. Thank you. Uh, this is one uh, that lets you get a broad sense of the burden of disease um, at different levels. So I'm showing you global levels. This is the burden of disease in 1990. And the metric here is simply counts of death. The colors show you the disaggregation into 21 broad causes. Each of the stacked bars is an age group. Uh, so you can see here in 1990, um, a lot of the overall burden of mortality comes from these young um, childhood age groups, uh, but really a concentration of the burden uh, in older ages and to, to two large clusters, so cardiovascular and circulatory diseases and cancers, uh, primarily causing uh, lost life at older ages. Fast forward to 2010, you can see that shifting pattern, uh, even more so the disease, burden disease concentrated at older ages. Now, of course, uh, from public health perspectives, uh, we care not just about the event of death, uh, but in some way regard a death at age 80 as a smaller loss than a death at, say, age 10. And so there's another measure of uh, premature mortality uh, that actually captures this lost stream of life. And you can see when you do that, you get a, a picture that really does put more emphasis on childhood killers, uh, which are claiming larger numbers of potential years, and you see things like HIV AIDS come in or road traffic accidents because these kill people at uh, young adult ages. Uh, now, one of the really important contributions of the study is to introduce uh, non-fatal outcomes into the dialogue on global health challenges. And so this is another metric, years lived with disability, that captures the prevalence of different conditions and weights those by how much health loss is caused by each. And you see here a very different picture of what are the major challenges. So we've got mental uh, behavioral disorders here in light green, uh, musculoskeletal disorders in light purple, uh, diabetes and other endocrine disorders, uh, and a constellation of other things. And so you very much see that the things that kill people are different than the things that ail them. Uh, so let me, in my minute that remains, show you another very powerful tool. Uh, and this starts with the same 21 causes, um, but is a sort of rectangular pie chart for the global picture. We can zoom in a little bit to make that more detailed. So you can see ischemic heart disease, stroke, but the size of each of these areas reflects the size of the burden. Uh, and you can look at that globally. You can look at that for a country like China. You can look at that over time to see how the burden has shifted. Uh, and what you see is the shift towards this blue area, which are the chronic diseases. We can also overlay a map beneath that. Um, so for example, you can look for a given cause, like communicable diseases as a big cause group of the number of DALIs by condition uh, or by country. You can click on a country and see their burden appear uh, on the top chart. Um, oh my goodness. Or we can look, let me just show you one last thing, which is the connection to risk factors. If you're interested in attributing things not just to diseases and injuries, there are also very powerful visualizations that let you think about risk factors and you can combine these two. Um, so that's a, a flavor of the very rich detail that's available. I encourage you all to have a look at that on the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation website. 
uh, really, uh, again, the, the intent to make this information accessible uh, to everybody around the world. Uh, and so let me just leave you with these um, notes that I won't uh, go into given, given time, but how does this relate to, uh, to developing rating systems for uh, companies' footprints? Uh, I just want to clarify what this does provide and what it does not. It's not a blueprint for action. It's, it doesn't give us the causal attribution of the burden of disease, but I think it does give us uh, a nice platform for understanding the context of major health problems uh, and metrics for trying to uh, incorporate these into estimates of evaluation. So let me leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, <coughs> so uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, useful just to uh, start off uh, from my talk with an assumption that if you did have a label that would increase uh, sales and be somehow Im important to uh, consumers, um, then in, in general, um, you think that labels, um, if they're going to affect corporate behavior in the right direction, you need to be aware of uh, several there's sort of several key questions that you need to ask. Um, you need to think about what kind of behavior we want to encourage, um, how to link that behavior to rewards. Um, usually the behavior itself may be difficult to measure, and so you may want to think about um, outcomes, for example, instead of uh, behavior itself. Um, you need to think about how accurate the measurement needs to be in order to be useful. And you also want to think about um, how much does bias in the reward system matter? Uh, because it's unlikely that you're going to have totally unbiased measurement or even unbiased transformation of measurement into rewards. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk very briefly about the Health Impact Fund, which I've been involved with over the last uh, few years. The uh, proposal is uh, for a reward system, which would be monetary, not label rewards, um, for companies that essentially agreed to uh, make their product available at a low price or cost, um, or even to license the product to generic producers, something like that, uh, and then would be compensated for this reduction in price by receiving uh, financial rewards. The financial rewards, in turn, would be uh, based on the outcomes that were achieved in terms of uh, the health impact of the product. So what we're looking to do is to scale the rewards to measured incremental quality adjusted life years like the dollies that uh, uh, Josh was talking about of a new medicine compared to the most probable alternative medicine. So in effect, we're thinking about what's the incremental benefit of a particular product rather than just uh, what, is, what does it do compared to placebo. Um, <clears throat> one important uh, point to make here is that measurement doesn't need to be perfectly accurate since uh, companies always only respond to expected rewards rather than actual rewards that uh, occur at a given time. Um, whatever behavior it is that you want to motivate is going to happen before the outcomes rise. So therefore, it's expected rewards that are the uh, motivator. There are a lot of big challenges as soon as you think about, well, what does it actually look like for a company to license a product or to, uh, if it's going to, what, what, what are the uh, incremental rewards that you, sorry, what, what are the, um, uh, what's the benefit of a particular product in terms of the, uh, the outcome? You need to measure the actual outcomes which is a substantial thing. Um, second, and perhaps this is uh, in a theoretical sense even harder, you need to be able to predict what the counterfactual outcome with the alternative treatment would have been. So had this product not been used, uh, the person would have received some treatment, what would that have been? Um, you need to untangle the effect of the medicine from other aspects of treatment, including other medicines. This is also complex. And then you need to compress the outcomes into a single index of health, such as qualities or the dollies that uh, Josh was referring to. Those are all complex, difficult, and very challenging. Um, the happy thing about this is that, in fact, pretty much all 
health insurance systems at the state level have been thinking about doing this already. So in Europe, in Canada, and I promise you also in the United States, more and more insurers are thinking about what's the value of a product in terms of its health impact because they're thinking about how do I deal with this new cancer therapy that's going to cost $100,000 per person. So that is happening everywhere in any case and they're already thinking about pretty much all of these questions. What's the incremental benefit of the product? What's not happening so much is ongoing measurement of the product after it's already been uh, included into a formulary and is being paid for. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, labeling issue and um, uh, assuming that you could uh, overcome the challenges of measurement, you still need to make the measure relate to the reward in an unbiased way. Um, so I think it's reasonable from an economic perspective that rewards should be proportional to the incremental benefits generated. And if you fail to do that in a systematic way, um, you're going to generate the wrong behavior. And in effect, that's actually the problem with our, our current system. Uh, so um, I guess so moving on to the second point there, right? If you think about the current system, the problem is that companies are rewarded uh, not for increasing health generally. That's not necessarily the focus, but the, what they're rewarded for is especially increasing the health of people who can pay. So neglected diseases are neglected mainly because the people who would benefit from treatments are very poor and can't pay very much. Um, so you'd want to think very hard about how do you make sure that um, uh, bias in the measurement system or uh, bias in the reward system uh, didn't distort behavior away from uh, desired outcomes. Um, I also wanted to uh, just observe that in general I think inaccuracy is not necessarily fatal um, since the firm does respond to the expected reward. And so I, I look forward to a discussion. Hi, I'm Eric Gassfriend. I'm a student at the Business School and Chair of Effective Philanthropy for the Social Enterprise Club there. Uh, and I'm John Sturm. I'm a junior at Harvard College and co-president of the student group Harvard Effective Altruism. Um, today we're talking about how our generation's attitudes are changing towards corporate social responsibility, how this has led to the growth of a new movement called Effective Altruism, and what this means for businesses that are trying to have an impact on global health. So our generation is the first to grow up with the internet, so we're used to having massive amounts of information and transparency available. Um, so for example, factcheck.org checks on what politicians are saying and whether it's really accurate or not. And a lot of the times it's not accurate, so that leads us to skepticism. Um, we're distrustful of big business, of advertising, of leaders because we have so much information coming in and we can see a lot of uh, the misleading information that's coming out. So in my view, the availability of information um, has allowed hypocrisy and mistruths to be more visible. Um, this has led us to become more skeptical. And for some people, that skepticism could turn into cynicism or apathy. But for a growing number of people, it's actually turning into a demand for rigor. How do we know that um, something that's being advertised really works? Um, if it's a cause in global health, how do we know what impact it's really having? So that leads us to effective altruism. Now, the idea behind altruism is to do good in the world. Um, the idea behind effective altruism is to update this um, with these core principles. The first of which is maximization. How can I do the most good possible in the world with the limited resources that I have? So an example of this is if a dollar can buy 10 times as much in Uganda as it can here in Boston, an effective altruist would say, why not leverage that dollar to where it can do the most good? Uh, rationality is another core principle. 
a lot of causes market themselves with pictures of cute kids or dogs and kittens, and we believe in trying to look past that and say, what's the real impact that this intervention is having? Skepticism, as I mentioned before, we try to look at the quality of the evidence behind the assertion. So um, if the evidence has had demonstrated to have impact through randomized controlled trials, we can have a good guess of um, the incremental impact over what would have happened otherwise. Um, transparency is another core value. The idea of making all the data and information available online um, and also admitting failure if some of the things you try don't work. And last but not least, cosmopolitanism, the idea that all lives have equal value. So an example of how these ideals can be applied. It costs about $40,000 to train a guide dog for the blind in the United States. It costs about $20 to $100 to prevent one case of blindness in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So an effective altruist would say, obviously we want people in the US who need guide dogs to have them, but recognizing that we can't help everybody who has blindness, um, if we can help 500 times as many people in Africa for the same price, then we should go where our leverage is the highest. So what this means for business is that we'd like to see stronger evidence of incremental impact, and we'd also like to see more transparency in terms of having the results available online.